We are still in Romans chapter 6, and it's the same message that we started last week. It's know who you are, part two, okay? And um, last week, we started talking about the fact that Paul wants us to think deeply about who we are in Christ. When we believed on Jesus, we became united with Jesus. When he died on the cross, our old man died with him. And when he rose again, we also rose again to walk in newness of life. So we are dead and we are alive. And man, that really changes everything. Well, in part two of the message here in Romans chapter six, on the surface... On the surface, it looks like God is asking something extremely difficult of every single one of us in here today. And I'm going to get to that as the message unfolds. And can I tell you? He is. He's asking for complete surrender. He's asking for complete trust. But here's the reality. God is good, right? Has God been good? We just took time, hopefully, to identify some different ways that God has been good in our lives. And the whole point of starting like that this morning is so that we get to the conclusion, how could we ever do anything but surrender? How could we do anything but trust God? How could we do anything but place ourselves completely and totally in his will? Think deeply about who you are in Christ so that we will become everything that he wants us to be. And so this morning's message is all about surrendering to who we are in Christ. So let's just jump right into it. I got the same exact outline as last week, all right? So the points are going to sound familiar, except there's a, a few different underneath them. But let's start with the inconceivable, okay? The inconceivable. Everybody look at verse 15. He says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Don't say those two words out loud together yet, those last two words, but save them. I'm going to get to them in just a minute, okay? So he's asking, Does God's grace give us permission to sin. That's essentially what he's asking. And if you were here last week, you're probably thinking, didn't we already talk about this? Didn't we already cover this in verse one? And the answer is yes. Paul already brought this up. It says it's almost the identical question that he asked in verse one. He's asking it again. And so you might be wondering, well, why would he bring it up a second time? We've already talked about it. We've already covered it. And the answer is this, who we are in Christ makes justification by grace dangerously clear. Where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. And in our human nature, we take advantage of that. We're like, if there's no sin that God won't forgive, then I can just sin away, right? We talked about that last week and we talked about the same answer, God forbid. But Paul's actually building on it a little bit here. He's adding another layer, another element to what he's already talked about. There's no sin that God won't forgive. But there's more than that. Look what he just got done saying in verse 14, okay? Look at verse 14. It says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now, here's the reality. I'll just sum this up, and I'll try to make it as simple as possible. There's no sin that God won't forgive, okay? And not only that, there's nothing that we can ever do to lose our salvation, When Christ died, he fulfilled the law and he fulfilled the penalty for the law. And when he rose again from the grave, he said he showed that he has greater power than sin and death and hell in the grave, which means that we know that not only did he fulfill the law, but he rose again. So we have confidence that we are going to rise again and we're going to live forever with God. And what Paul says right there is because of all of that reality, you're set free. You're not under the law. There's nothing that you have to do to earn your salvation. There's nothing that you can do to lose your salvation because it's not dependent on us. It's completely dependent upon Jesus Christ. So you are not under the law. You are under grace. You are a free man and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Now, I don't know about you, but that's what I'm talking about. I'm free. I'm my own man. That means I get to do what I want, when I want, however I want, right? Right? What's Paul's answer to that question? What's he say at the end of verse 15, those two words? God forbid. God forbid. Uh, Remember when you were a kid. Guys, any of you remember that? Remember all the way back. Some of you are kids in here, okay? So this will sound good on that end. But remember back to when you were a kid and you remember when you really thought, when I am an adult and I am all grown up, I am going to do what I want when I want, however I want. No one's going to stop me from doing it. Am I the only one that's ever had that thought go through my mind? Come on, y'all. 
Get here with me. Okay, there's a few honest people in here. Father and son, actually, that was a duo. So right there. Anyway, I, I remember thinking that way. Like, I remember thinking, I can't wait till the day when no one tells me what time to go to bed again. That's going to be awesome. I can't wait to the day where I get to eat whatever I want. I can have whatever snacks I want. I can leave them out in my house. I don't have to make my bed. I don't have to do my laundry. I can do what I want, when I want, however I want. You understand what we're talking about? Man, no more cell phone restrictions. Kids, your parents, are, they're never going to be able to take it away from you again when you're an adult and you have freedom, right? Everything's going to be perfectly fine and okay. Now, how many of you think that that's a, a good idea for the way to live? Like, we have these restrictions in our life right now as children. You have parents in your life to help train you and mentor you. So that way when you become an adult, you can throw off all of that responsibility and live however you want. Makes a lot of sense, right? No, it's the same. Yes, we have smart kids in here. That's what I'm talking about. You all are, you're doing a good job. Is that Brock? No, some, okay, one more row behind. Good job. All right, there we go. The point why I bring that up is, does freedom from the law give us license to do whatever we want? And just as we all know how foolish it is to think what we, when we really become adults, we can do what we want, how we want, whenever we want. The same thing is true when we get saved. Freedom from the law doesn't give us freedom to go live and sin and do whatever we want because God's going to forgive us. God forbid that we think that way. That's the furthest thing from the truth. I've got a practical application for you right off the bat, and it's two simple words. Grow up. Grow up. You know what, kids? All of you teenagers, children in here, guess what's going to happen? One day, you are going to grow up, and in one form or another, you will become your parents. It's going to happen. Now, there might be some things that are a little bit different and some things that you throw off and you decide to do differently. But one day you're going to wake up and you're going to discover the fact that I really should go to bed because I feel a lot better when I sleep. <laughs> and I really should be careful about what I eat because I don't like feeling disgusting all the time. And I really should do my laundry because nobody wants to come within 10 feet of me because I stink and I smell really bad. And one day you're going to come to those conclusions all on your own and responsibility is going to become a part of your life. And I use all of that because it's a wonderful analogy to talk about the main point of where Paul's going. We're saved. We are saved. If you have put your faith in Jesus, your old man is dead. You have a new man. Walk in newness of life. And so what does that mean? It's time to grow up. It's time to make some huge adult decisions so that we can move forward in our walk with Christ and in our relationship with Christ. And that's where we're going with this whole passage. Okay, so that's the inconceivable. Here's the second point. The believable. The believable. Look at verse 16. It says in verse 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Now, I want you to understand that Paul is talking about slavery here. Just like last week he used baptism as an illustration, in this passage he's using slavery as an illustration which was alive and well during his day now he's not talking about the slaves that are captured in war and sold in the marketplace he's talking about voluntary slavery he says know ye not it's basically saying don't you know and the answer to the question is yes they they do know the people his audience that he's writing to 2,000 years ago totally understand where he's going with this illustration they knew Here's a sad reality of life. They knew that people in desperate situations would voluntarily offer themselves up to a slave master so that way they would have a place to live. That way they would have food to eat. But these people also fully understood that the moment that they voluntarily placed themselves in the hands of a master, in the hands of that owner, that they lost their freedom forever. They could not simultaneously be free and simultaneously be a servant. And so that's, that's the picture that he's going. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey. You have a decision that you have to make in your life. And when you yield yourself to a master, you now become obedient to that master. Now, there's a huge lesson 
that he's talking about here. Slavery is not just a legal status, but a living experience. Here's a lesson that he's going with. There's no such thing as freedom from all outside powers and influences. We know that even when we grow up, we're never really truly autonomous, right? Because you still have employers. You always are going to have somebody that you have to answer to in life. We will never be completely free. We are never going to be completely autonomous. And so the lesson that we have to learn before we get to the believable who we are is that there is no free person here. We are all either slaves unto sin or slaves of obedience unto righteousness, There is no total free autonomy. Now, you might be wondering like I'm wondering. Remember at the beginning when I said Paul's going to lead us to a really hard, on the surface, it's going to look like a really hard decision? Slavery? You're telling me that, that this new life, walk in newness of life, you're telling me that this new life, this new freedom looks like slavery? Is that where he's going? Now, I'm going to skip a little bit ahead and go out of order here because I feel like at this point we need to add a huge disclaimer, which Paul also adds. Look at verse 19. Everybody look at verse 19a. Well, the beginning of verse 19. That's what my notes say, verse 19a. Verse 19, it says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. It's almost like Paul is, essentially he's apologizing here for having to use slavery as an illustration. And I I want to drive this point home, and I want to just say this. Everything about slavery, which is a result of sinful men, is disgusting and wrong. It's it's slavery. Treating people like pieces of property that can be bought and sold, that flies directly in the face of everything that God is about and everything that God stands for. He created human beings in his image and his likeness. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, and that is all people of all times, of all races. doesn't matter how rich or poor you are. That's all of God's people. Slavery flies exactly in the face of everything that God created us as human beings to be. God never intended for humans to be treated this way. He never intended for his creation to become so desperate that we would have to willingly offer ourselves up into the hands of somebody else just so that we can eat. This is all a result of the sin-cursed wickedness that is in our world today, okay? So in a sense, Paul's embarrassed that he has to use a human illustration like slavery, but it's a human illustration that resonates that we can understand, And so there's a disclaimer that he himself, that God himself puts in this passage. But then let's go back to the good news, okay? The huge exchange that takes place. All right, so we're talking about slavery. There are no free people here. And it's not a perfect illustration, but it's one that is going to resonate, that we're going to be able to understand. So now let's talk about the good positive side about it. The huge exchange. Everybody look at verse 17 and everybody say those first four words out loud together with me. It says, but... God be thanked. But God be thanked. We're going somewhere really positive here. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. And then go ahead and put verse 18 up on the screen. Verse 18, the next verse, yes. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Not only when we got saved did our old man die and we become a brand new creation in Christ, there was also a wonderful exchange of masters that took place. We were the servants of sin and our master was Satan, but now we are the servants of righteousness unto obedience and our master is God. And this exchange is so complete and so wonderful that you know what Paul does? He breaks out in spontaneous praise in the middle of this this deep theological argument, this understanding and teaching of who we are. And he says, but God be thanked. You were made free. We are saved. There's something completely different about being a servant to God than being a servant to sin. So here's the believable, okay? Last week we talked about I am dead and I am alive. Here's the believable. I was a servant to sin. I was a servant to sin. Sin is not your typical master. Sin is deceptive and deceitful. Nobody serves sin out of a sense of duty. Guess what? We voluntarily serve sin. 
We give ourselves up to sin. You know why? Because his demands seem so pleasant. You know what sin does? Sin exercises his power over us by the pleasure that he promises. You know the power that sin holds over us? The pleasure that he promises. And we don't go kicking and dragging our feet like, oh man, I've got to go do this sin in my life. No, we go willingly. We voluntarily walk right into it because it promises so much pleasure. And can I tell you the truth this morning? There is pleasure in sin. There absolutely is. The Bible even tells us that. There is pleasure in sin, but for a... But that doesn't uh, negate the fact that there is pleasure in sin. That's just the honest reality. I want to talk about a couple things here. I've been praying so hard about just the way to bring this to life, to help us to understand. And what are some sins that we could talk about? You know, one that came to my mind, marijuana. Let's just talk about that for a minute. Marijuana. How many of you agree that marijuana is literally everywhere? It's not skunks that you're smelling while you're driving down the road, okay? <laughs> it's an awful, terrible smell. And it's every, it literally is everywhere. It's becoming legalized everywhere. Now, I just want to share my heart with you about this. I, I believe with all my heart that the Bible does teach that we should never place ourselves under the influence of anybody but the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 5, it says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein it's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And the overarching principle there is, why would we ever, as new creations in Christ, walking in newness of life, as servants to God, which we're going to talk about in a minute, why would we ever yield ourselves up to an influence that is outside of the Holy Spirit, that can take over our senses and can lead to a lot of awfulness. So I just want to say that right off the bat. I, I believe there's a biblical precedent to say that it's wrong. And I bring this up because Satan is deceptive and he is very good. And I've heard a lot of different arguments out there. It's all natural. It's harmless. It helps me relax. It helps me enjoy the moment. And guess what? All of that is true. There is pleasure in sin, but for a season. Let me just ask you with this. Then what? What? Do you understand that sin is never fully satisfying and fulfilling? Very few people are strong enough just to take a little bit and then walk away from it and it doesn't touch them anymore. You know what most people do? Most people need something more and something bigger. And so you move on to the next high and the next high. And before you know it, sin's got you completely grabbed in its clutches and you did it yourself. You walked voluntarily into it. That's the kind of master that sin is. Can I tell you? Sin feels nothing like slavery. It feels like freedom. Look at verse 20. Look what it says. For when ye were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Sin feels nothing like slavery. It feels like freedom. Before you were saved, man, you you weren't the servant of righteousness. It didn't really matter what was right and wrong. We lived by our own standard of what is right and what is wrong. And man, the pleasure of sin, it felt so appealing. And so we willingly, voluntarily offer ourselves up to it. And we walk down that path and we walk down that road because we were free from God's law and we were free from the consequences that come with it and from the righteousness that God wants us to live. But can I tell you this? Our sin master is a liar. Every time you sin, you lose. Every time you sin, you lose. Look at verse 21. It sums this up perfectly. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. How many of you look back on your past and when you gave yourselves up voluntarily to sin and to things you knew weren't wrong, that that were wrong? How many of you agree when you look back on that, man, there's no pride and joy in that five or ten years that God gave you. There's only regret and sorrow and shame that came as a result of it. That's what sin does. Sin is a liar. Man, we could have talked about, I I was looking up the seven deadly sins. The last one is lust. I, I I tell you, one of the biggest, almost, almost every reason, probably 90% of the people that end up in my office for counseling and for help has to do with some sort of a sexual sin. Whether it's pornography, whether it's a sexual relationship outside of marriage, it seems like it all ends up back to that. And can I tell you, there's pleasure in sin. Two teenagers, 
out there living their best life. Oh, it feels like freedom to go give yourselves up and to do something that we know the Bible clearly says is wrong. But ask that teenage girl who got pregnant and the husband's now, I mean, the man's now gone and she's off raising a child by herself. And I know God's gracious and good. Don't misunderstand anything I'm saying, but I promise you there's regrets that come along with that. Ask the husband or wife who maybe their marriage was starting to fall apart and and it was getting difficult and Satan starts putting lies in our head and you want to feel something again. And so you go out and you, for a few moments of pleasure, you sacrifice and lose everything that is good and valuable in your life. Ask those couples how good of a master sin is and if it was worth it. Man, I am so thankful that we have an addiction recovery program here on Friday nights. You know, one thing I appreciate so much about the people that come to that program, by the way, my heart breaks and goes out, but I appreciate they are some of the most honest people in all the world. And they recognize that they need help. And they recognize they will be the first ones to tell you to listen to what's being said here today from God's word, to stay far away from it because they understand how horrible and wretched and deceitful the master of sin is because it truly does enslave you and it captures you and it puts you in these impossible situations where it feels like, can I ever be delivered? But thanks be to God, yes, the grace of God is greater, but why in the world would we ever voluntarily walk down that path and put ourselves in that time? of a situation that's where Paul's going grow up he didn't die on a cross to save us so we could go enjoy all the things that destroy us no God forbid God forbid sin is a liar I'll just throw one more in pornography I think is probably the best example of this because nobody feels good ever about pornography It's a little bit different than some of those other sins. But it's powerful and it promises pleasure. But every single time you get done looking at it, you feel disgusting and worthless and you you don't like it. But yet it's so powerful, it just sucks you back in. And all I'm trying to say today is we could name and list a whole bunch of stuff that is destructive, that is destroying our lives, that's not fulfilling us, that's not satisfying us, that's not making us more like Christ, that's not making us better people. It's actually hurting us and crippling us and ruining our minds and giving ourselves extra baggage that we have to deal with in life. I was a servant to sin. That's how I was born into this world, almost powerless against it, but thanks Be to God that he went to a cross and he died so that I could be saved and so that a wonderful exchange could take place in my life and I could now voluntarily offer myself up to God because that's what it's about. I am a servant of God. I am a servant of God. I was a slave to sin, but I am a servant to God. Look at verse 22. But now... Being made free from sin and become servants to God. Man, those are such good words. Free from sin. A servant to God. The freedom of the Christian is not freedom to do what he wants. But it is a freedom to obey God. By the way, God has every right to demand this of us. He's our creator. And here's the point. God's not a cruel taskmaster. He's not a cruel owner in heaven that said, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. Your moms might tell you that sometimes. But listen, God truly did bring us into this world and he truly could take us out every anytime that he wanted to. He's our He's our creator. He's the owner of all things. He has every right to demand complete allegiance to him. But he doesn't do it in that sense that we have to live completely in fear of every step that I make. No, he delivered us the grace of God so that we would have freedom to voluntarily yield ourselves up to him and submit our lives unto him. Because God as our master is nothing like sin as our master. Do you understand the grace of God? Mabel was talking this morning about the kindness that God wants to pour out. Man, the grace of God is unbelievable. He does little kindnesses all the time in our life. Like he didn't just save us and free us from the guilt of sin. He adopted us into his family. I'm a child of God. At the end of the service this morning, we're going to sing, Good, Good Father. Because that's exactly what he is. He is a good father. He's perfect in all of his ways. 
Listen, his yoke is easy. His burden is light. He doesn't want us to live stressed out, worry-filled life. He wants us to live in the freedom of who he is. Hey, he doesn't pay us wages that we earn because if he did, we would get eternal damnation. But he gives us gifts that we don't deserve over and over and over again. How many of you got up this morning and you were thankful that his mercies were new and fresh every morning? Man, I'm thankful that I was thinking about this message this morning. I was thinking about some of like yesterday's failures and not necessarily winning moments. And we have them every day. And God doesn't want us to get up every day and beat ourselves up that we failed yesterday. No, his mercies are new and fresh every morning. I'm free from the law, not so that I can go back to it, but so that I can take advantage of that mercy and that grace that's there today so I can walk in that and be that new man and have victories that I enjoy and experience today. That's who our God is. Voluntarily give your life to him. Learn your master. Love your master. That's what it's all about. It's not about the list of rules. He's not even got to those things yet he's just saying you're now a servant to God and I'm a good father because I died for you and my grace is available so learn me love me get to know me because I am a different master in every way than you could possibly imagine so the conclusion of this message the doable (coughs) excuse me the doable serve righteousness serve righteousness here's the doable serve righteousness We are slaves to God, but I don't know if you noticed the language that was used all throughout this passage. Like, for instance, you don't have to go to these verses. I'll just reiterate them. But in verse 16, he said that we were either servants of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. He doesn't say servant to God. He says we're servants of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. In verse 18, he said that we became the servants of righteousness. Then in verse 19, he ends with this. Even so, now yield yourself members, now yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. So I was a slave to sin. I'm now a slave to God. But what does that mean? That means I serve righteousness. Well, what does it mean to serve righteousness? It means get up every day and hunger and thirst after righteousness. That's what the Beatitudes talked about. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Get up every day and want to please your master. Get up every day and want to obey him. Get up every day and want to spend time with him. Get up every day and want to know him. Serve righteousness. Do the things that you know are right to do in your life every single day. That's what God wants us to do. That's the doable. Be a a cheerful, happy servant of God. Here's the second part. The doable. Serve righteousness. Enjoy the fruit. Enjoy the fruit. Look at verses 22 and 23. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Verse 23. Very familiar verse. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's talking in this verse ultimately about your master's sin ultimately is going to pay you with eternal damnation and punishment, death, separation from God, in hell forever. That's what sin will pay you. But God doesn't pay you. He gives you a gift. And that gift ultimately is eternal life. But before we get to the end, before we get to eternal damnation or eternal life, we live in the present. And guess what you get to enjoy in the present? You get to enjoy either the fruit of sin and all of the shame that comes with it that we talked about, or you get to enjoy the fruit unto holiness, which is completely different. The fruit of serving righteousness and serving God is completely different than the fruit of sin, which leads to shame. (laughs) What he's saying here is enjoy the process of sanctification. Enjoy becoming like Christ. Follow me here. Being set free from sin, the day you got saved. How many of you would say, amen, that was a gift from God? There we go, okay. That's an incredible gift, right? But it doesn't stop there. Being made righteous. He declared us righteous. We're no longer guilty. We don't no longer, it's not like we got out of jail and we paid our crimes, but it's still on our record. No, our record has been erased. When he looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is a free gift of God. Guess what else? Being able to serve him. 
The fact that I can voluntarily offer myself to Christ in service to him is a gift from God that I don't deserve. Having the fruit of holiness, being made like Jesus every day as I serve righteousness and as I learn my master and I love my master as he begins to transform me as I walk in that newness of life that is a gift from God that I don't deserve and guess where it's all going to culminate as we follow God and as we serve righteousness and as we love our master life gets better and better and better and then ultimately it ends in eternal life and eternal life is what it will take for God to exhaust the riches of his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. His grace is limitless. And eternal life is every day getting up with that kindness and the grace of God that's just going to be lavished out on us every single day of our lives. All right, so I need a way to bring this to life. I was thinking about professional athletes. And when I think about professional athletes, number one, I get just a tad bit aggravated because every morning I get up early and I work out. And you know what? This flab is not going anywhere. And I often think to myself, if I was a professional athlete, if my job was to keep my body in prime shape, I would be amazing. I would. I mean, that's my job. I mean, I get up and I just have to eat right and exercise and I have all, you know, and I was thinking about that. That would be incredible. So then I started thinking about professional athletes and all the different perks that come to it. And I have to apologize before I use this illustration, kind of like what, what Paul did, just give a disclaimer. It's not a perfect illustration, but it's one that's going to have to do, okay? I was thinking about LeBron James this morning. LeBron James, whether you like him or not as a basketball player, not my favorite, but I'm telling you what, the guy is getting old and he's still putting up 35 points a game. you got to give him some respect, okay? This man spends up to $1.5 million on his body every single year. Now, you know what he's doing. Okay, let me break this down. In a sense, LeBron James is serving the God of basketball. That's his God. But you know what he does every day? He gets up and he serves righteousness unto obedience. He invests in the right things, the things that he's supposed to do every single day. And he realizes, if I'm going to accomplish all my goals and do the things that I want, I need to invest in my body. I need to take care of myself. So he spends a million and a half dollars on personal chefs and personal trainers and massage therapists and all kinds of crazy technology. And as a result, he's doing things at a, I think he's like 38 or 39 He's doing things that I could only dream about doing. I ain't doing nothing like that at this age, okay? You all understand. Here's where this translates into the Christian life. Sometimes we look around it. We look at other people that just excel. They're at the, they're at the top. I mean, A game and everything. And we start thinking, I, I can never be that. Am I going to be excel or be great in anything? Can I tell you that we have the opportunity to serve God? And can I tell you that our duty every day is just to serve righteousness unto holiness. And if we get up every single day of our lives and we learn our master and we love our master and we soak up his word. And if he says, do this, and then we do it. And if he says, stay away from that, we stay away from it. If we evaluate things that might not be, they might be okay. Instead of Why do we sit and debate if it's right or wrong or not? We spend so much time. Why don't we just run away from those debates and those arguments and just do what's best? Just invest in the things that are right. You understand when we get up every day and we just accept the truth of what he's saying here in this word and we obey it. We get to enjoy the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I don't have a million and a half dollars to spend on my body. I got something greater and better than that. I got the Holy Spirit of God living inside of me. I got resurrection power that can transform every single area of my life. I can't be what God wants me to be, but I can get up every day and I can do my part and surrender and trust and obey. And then As I go through every day, that power is going to be poured out and I'm going to be transformed and people are going to see the light of Jesus in my life. That is something that every single person in here can do and live and you can be Christians that truly let the light of Jesus shine in your life to a world that's in desperate need of. There's something better. There's something better than all this brokenness. There's something better than 
than feeling like I'm stuck and I'm powerless to change. There's something better than broken marriages. There's something better than addictions. There's something better than living a life of sin and hopelessness and just going through life, not being satisfied and fulfilled. There's something better than being a prime athlete like LeBron James. Yes, can I tell you, there's something better than being a billionaire. There's something better than anything that this world has to offer you. And his name is Jesus. And if we surrender our lives and submit to him, And we truly voluntarily say, I am a servant of God. Wow. Everything about your life can change. You will enjoy the fruit of holiness, and it's all a free gift of God. Don't worry. It will never be dependent on how good your day was yesterday or how good your day is today. It will just be dependent on you trusting in Jesus and letting him transform your life.